Vigilantes are a hotly debated topic, and you will find a lot of people divided on it. Some people will say that the police should handle the bad guys and they should face their punishments in court, but then some will say that the police really don't do enough and sometimes the courts just give the guy a slap on the wrist. But no matter what side of the argument you're on, you cannot deny that a good vigilante anti-hero story is entertaining. Whether or not you actually want to root for him though, well, that's up to you. Jason Vukovic, better known as the Alaskan Avenger. Please leave a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. <coughs> but before we get into the mad lad, this video is brought to you by Raycon. With Raycon earbuds you can enhance your listening experience with amazing quality at half the price of other premium audio brands. The new everyday earbuds are out doing similar products with an improved rubber material that looks both fashionable and discreet, as well as including comfortable but secure gel tips to provide a universal fit for maximum comfort and security, regardless of the shape or size of your ears. And Raycons are more adaptable than ever. They have a built-in mic that allows you to take calls at the single push of a button, they are compatible with both Siri and Alexa, and include three easy-to-toggle audio profiles for you to customise your listening experience. They also offer eight hours of playtime and a 32-hour battery life and 49,000 five-star reviews on their website. I use my Raycons every day whenever I'm travelling and sometimes when I need to shut out the noise around me and concentrate on work because everyone in the studio keeps talking. So if you want to get some top tier earbuds whilst also supporting my channel then click my link down in the description box below or go to buyraycon.com slash dankula to get an exclusive deal of up to 15% off your order. Jason Christian Vukovic was born in Anchorage, Alaska in 1975 to a single mother. He said that he had never met his biological father and has no memories of him. He did, however, have a brother named Joel and a stepdad named Larry Lee Fulton, who eventually married his mother and adopted him when he was four years old. However, instead of being a caring replacement for his biological father, Larry abused both Jason and Joel in various different ways that I'm not going to go into. Larry and Jason's mother were both extremely devout Christians and they would go to church about two or three times a week, though Larry used late night prayer with Jason as a guise for, well, you know what. Not only was Larry abusing Jason and his brother in that way, but he was also beating and torturing the hell out of them. One of the things that he used on them was a 2x4 that he had modified so a hit from it would be even more brutal and painful. Jason remembers that through a lot of his childhood he would have bruises covering most of his back, his arse and his legs and some days he wouldn't even be able to walk. After not being able to take any more of the abuse, Jason's brother Joel ran away from home for a short time, but he was eventually picked up by the police. While Joel was being held, he was terrified of being sent back to Larry. So, he opened up to the police about his reasons for running away. He told them that both he and his brother were being physically and sexually abused by their adopted father, Larry. The police took these allegations very seriously, and they very likely saw some physical proof on Joel's body. So, they started an investigation into the abuse. But, when Jason was questioned about it, he never made it clear how bad it really was. He later said that 
he played the abuse down because he was a 14-year-old boy at the time and he was absolutely terrified of Larry. He was worried that if he snitched on Larry, Larry would get him. Also, opening up about what had happened to him was something that Jason found very difficult to do because of all of the trauma he had gone through he would really rather not relive it. It didn't take long for the police to arrest Larry and charge him for abusing the two boys. And with how horrific the abuse was, you would expect Larry to face some severe punishment. Wrong. He was charged with second degree abuse of a minor, but as part of a plea deal, he was given a three year suspended sentence. So, not only did he not spend a single day in prison, but he was allowed to immediately go back home, where he obviously continued to abuse Jason and Joel. And to make things even worse, after Larry was sentenced, the rest of the family hated Joel for snitching on Larry. The family then packed up and sold their house, moving to the city of Wasilla, keeping a low profile from then on. Jason remembers being homeschooled at this time and that he was also being kept in almost complete isolation. This was likely because his family were trying to keep up appearances and hide what was going on. So, all the charge against Larry really did was make his family get better at hiding the abuse. The Alaskan authorities never provided any follow-up help, any therapy, or even any checkups for Joel and Jason. They were pretty much just completely forgotten about. At the age of around 16, Jason was considering getting the fuck out himself, so he would spend most of his time working so that he didn't have to be at home, and also so he could save up as much money as he could to support himself when he did finally leave. One night, Jason plucked up the courage and climbed out of his bedroom window, and then he came back the next day to collect his belongings so he could finally leave. The Problem was, his parents kept his driver's license and social security card from him, saying that they, and I quote, didn't want to facilitate his flight into sin. So, he wasn't able to get his documents. But, despite all of that, Jason still wanted to get as far away from home as he possibly could. So, he made his way to the city of Spokane in Washington. While Jason lived there, he was struggling to find a place to stay, or even get any legitimate work, because he didn't have any of his IDs. So, out of desperation, he turned to petty crime, like stealing things from lockers in the gym. But, after around five months of doing that, he was caught by the police and arrested for theft, and he was also charged with forging checks, which landed him in juvenile prison for nine months. Luckily for Jason, he was never sent back home to Alaska when he was released, but he had to continue stealing to survive. He desperately wanted a legitimate job because despite the fact that he did manage to get some jobs which were mostly in construction, he either couldn't hold them down or they weren't permanent. And since he had no ID, he was gloriously underpaid for the work he did get. So, not exactly the stable career path that Jason was looking for. Jason would have no other choice but to turn back to crime in between jobs, and he would use some of the money that he made to buy a lot of weed. Jason was smoking an awful lot of weed. He said that it helped him to numb the pain from the memories of his past, and it made his current situation a little easier to tolerate. At the age of 18, Jason was picked up by the police again, but this time it was for driving without a license, and since he was now legally an adult, he would go to real prison for a month. He was caught for driving offences another eight times, and each time he was caught, the authorities would increase his time in jail. This 
kind of lifestyle went on way into Jason's adulthood. And he said that he could never get enough money to make his situation any better. He could only live day by day. He started to have severe depression and even considered suicide because he couldn't see any other way out. Fortunately, instead of ending his life, he decided to move back to Alaska and try to start over, hoping that the outcome this time would be different. Jason did not want his past to stop him from enjoying living life as a free man in his home state, though he was stuck in a vicious cycle and quickly turned to crime again. This time, he started stealing credit cards. Eventually, Jason was caught again and he served his longest sentence yet of six years behind bars. When he was released, it didn't take him long to break the rules of his parole and he was sent back to jail for a further three years for eluding. Jason just couldn't catch a break and the prison system did not help him to reform at all. Despite him wanting to live a stable life, he hadn't even received any therapy to resolve his childhood trauma. But for a time after he was released again, Jason actually managed to live a more stable, crime-free life, though he had a lot of trouble finding work. Not because of his IDs, he had his IDs now, but it was because he had a criminal record in multiple states. Jason was briefly married, but during the marriage, his wife alleged that he assaulted her, something that Jason denies to this day. His life slowly began to unravel again, so after a while, he went from smoking weed to smoking meth. This was the lowest point of Jason's life, and he started thinking about all of the horrible things that he had been through and how harshly life had treated him. He thought to himself, my life would not be like this if not for that abusive piece of shit destroying my life and then getting away with it. Jason decided to watch some TV to calm down, and all that was on the news were a bunch of reports of kids in his area being molested and adults abusing their positions of authority to take advantage of the young. Jason knew all too well what these kids were going through, because his whole life he himself had struggled to mentally come to terms with what happened to him during his childhood. Jason knew that these perpetrators were just going to get a slap on the wrist while the kids they abused were going to go through an entire life of suffering. Jason did not want any more innocent children to turn out like him. So, he decided to do something about it. In 2016, Jason started writing down the addresses of a number of sex offenders that had targeted children, which was very easy for him to do since they were all listed on the nation's public sex offenders registry, or as Jason liked to call it, the quest log. Jason said that while he was writing down the names and addresses, the same thoughts kept going through his head. He kept remembering how, when he was young, he couldn't do anything to stop the abuse, and no one stepped up on his behalf to keep him safe or punish his abuser. So, if the authorities weren't going to protect kids and punish abusers, Jason was going to do it himself. At 9.30am on the 25th of June, Jason knocked on the door of 68-year-old Charles Alby. After Charles had answered the door, Jason immediately pushed him inside and ordered him to go to his room and sit on his bed. Jason then started slapping Charles repeatedly across the face and then beat the absolute shit out of him, all while berating him about his past sex offences. After Jason had fled the scene, Charles called the police and told them that Jason had a list of names with him, proving that this attack wasn't going to be a one-off. Two days later, Jason arrived at his second target's home, a 25-year-old named Andre Barbosa. Jason arrived at around 4am, again knocking on the door, although this time Jason had two women with him. 
After confirming that the guy answering the door was the guy they were looking for, Jason pulled out a hammer and forced his way inside the house while threatening Barbosa. Jason then ordered the absolutely terrified Barbosa to sit in a chair. Jason then did the same as his last target by telling him how disgusting he was while beating the absolute shit out of him. Although this time, Jason also threatened Barbosa, telling him he would bash his dome in with the hammer, while also saying that he was there to collect what Barbosa owed. One of the women that was with Jason actually filmed the beating while the other women walked around Barbosa's apartment stealing a bunch of things. Jason later joined her and stole a bunch of items himself and then they all got the hell out of there, leaving a very bloodied Barbosa behind while making off in Barbosa's truck. The final attack that Jason committed was on the 29th of June. A 67-year-old man named Wesley Demarest said that he heard someone break into his house at around 1am. Jason made his way inside the property and after finding Wesley, he gave him a choice. He could either get down on his knees or lie down on his bed. Jason then shouted in Wesley's face, I'm an avenging angel. I'm going to mete out justice for the people you hurt. Wesley then, very unwisely, refused to obey Jason's orders and then started swinging punches at Jason. So Jason said, stop. Have hammer time. <laughs> and uh, beat Wesley in the head six times with the hammer, leaving him unconscious and with a fractured skull. After Wesley had regained consciousness, he immediately called the police, who found Jason nearby. Like a scene out of Drive, Jason was chilling in a Honda Civic with his hammer, a bunch of stolen possessions, and the notebook that contained the names and addresses of all of his targets. So, you know, some, some pretty damning evidence. Wesley has since said that the injuries inflicted upon him by Jason left him with permanent brain damage, so he now struggles with speaking, which led to him losing his job, even though Wesley gave a TV interview where he's talking completely fine. I don't think that their place of work should be listed. Um, I don't think their address should be public knowledge. I think the name should be enough. Wesley is then quoted as saying, he's pretty much destroyed my life. So he got what he wanted, I guess. And Wesley's life had been ruined. Though, given that Wesley was very recently convicted for second degree abuse of a minor, boohoo, no one fucking cares. So at the age of 42, Jason was facing a total of 18 charges, including assault, robbery, burglary, and theft. But he just chided it out and pleaded not guilty on all counts, although later, as part of a plea deal, he agreed to accept the charge of first-degree attempted assault and a consolidated account of first-degree robbery in order to drop 12 other charges. Jason was then handed a sentence of 23 years in prison, with parole being available after six years. Jason However, didn't break down crying when he got his sentence. Instead, he smiled. And in one of the most well-known and iconic pictures of Jason, he can be seen smiling at his brother Joel during sentencing. When you know the full backstory of these two men, this picture speaks a thousand words. Joel is obviously disappointed that his brother is going to prison for a long time, but he understands why his brother did it, and Jason can tell that he understands. Jason's attorney, Ember Tilton, said that they don't believe Jason deserved to be punished, since he has been punished from childhood. All of his crimes stemmed from him being an abuse victim and needing to escape, living in poverty with nothing and no one to support him, and also using drugs to help him cope with the mental issues he had developed from his traumatic childhood. 
I think Jason's life would have been so much better if the government actually gave a shit and had given him the right support and therapy he needed after they discovered he was being abused. The public response to Jason was mixed, since people didn't know whose side to be on. Yes, vigilante justice can be a huge problem and punishments should fit the crime, but also no one wants to stick up for a paedophile. During the first few years into his sentence, Jason stuck by what he did, believing it to be the right kind of justice against some of the lowest scum the world has to offer. Jason was proud of his actions. But after some time to think about what he did, Jason has changed his mind and has urged other people not to become vigilantes. Jason now understands that his life has been many bad decisions on top of other bad decisions. And he is now trying his hardest to make his life better. Jason is still in prison and is hopefully finally getting the help and therapy that he desperately needed. And we can end this video with some words from Jason himself. I want my story to serve as a deterrent. My choices led me to where I currently sit, looking at 20 years in prison. If you have already lost your youth, like me, due to a child abuser, please do not throw away your present and your future joy by committing acts of violence. Cherish your own life and freedom. Learn from my story and seek peace not retribution. This all just truly is a really tragic story. None of this would have happened and it could have all been avoided if the police just actually did something about the abuse that Jason was going through. And if afterwards he could have received, you know, some kind of therapy. You know, even, even a knock at the door from the police to check up on him. I mean, he didn't even get that. Now, I understand that a lot of you might be disappointed that Jason has walked back his actions and he now shows remorse, but I would like you all to remember that after six years, he can apply for parole. And you need to say things like that if you want to get parole. Just saying. It's Count Dankula on YouTube! Everybody subscribe!